I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we are gathered here this afternoon, the Jagara and Turrbal peoples, and to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to our First Nations colleagues here with us today. I too would like to acknowledge the Lenape peoples of the area of New York where we lived, and also, I would like to acknowledge the Zulu peoples, descendants of the Nguni peoples of Southern Africa, where I was born and grew up. And to them, I say, Sabona. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank all at CARI, at the CON, at AEL, and at Griffith, and my host institution, NYU, and Fulbright for making this possible. I'd particularly like to acknowledge our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Carolyn Evans, for being an inspiring role model. She shared a piece of advice during our Fulbright orientation that I'm going to come back to again and again, and she sends our best wishes for today. I'd also like to acknowledge our Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Scott Harrison, who is here with us today. Thank you for coming, Scott. And thank you for saying to me, go for it, when I said, ah, oh, what do you think about this Fulbright idea? That was all the encouragement that I needed. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Professor Jerry Doherty, our Dean Research AEL, who I believe is coming along today and a great champion of our research. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Vanessa Tomlinson, uh, Director of CARI, for her inspiring and fearless leadership and constant support. Also, I'd love to acknowledge Professor Bernard Lansky and members of the CON Executive and staff here for backing me on this audacious adventure and also welcoming me home so beautifully. I'd like to acknowledge my NYU host, Professor Barbara Hesser, for all the amazing and beautiful memories. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge my husband, Gavin, who is here today, the best travel companion I could have asked, and I certainly couldn't have done this without you, so thank you. Although we're sitting in a very big and dark hall with my voice booming in a way that might uh, be toned down in a little while, I want to make this an intimate space. I didn't want to hide behind the podium. I wanted to be here to sit with you, Imagine I'm sitting at a bar in New York, having a nice cup of tea, and, and telling and sharing some stories of this experience. My talk today is in two parts. In the first part, I want to do some contextualising, and in the second part, I want to do some storytelling. So to begin, I'd like to frame my stories with a few insights first and foremost about Fulbright because I know there might be some people sitting in the hall secretly thinking, I might like to go for a Fulbright, so I want to talk a little bit about it. I'd also love to talk about my topic, that beautiful big apple, and then tell you a bit about the creative process that I've followed to craft the stories that I'm going to share in the second half today. So first and foremost, what is a Fulbright? Everyone's heard of a Fulbright, right? I can say it to anyone and they know immediately. There's even a Paul Simon lyric in his song, I Know What I Know, about the girl that got the Fulbright. The Fulbright program is the flagship foreign exchange scholarship program in the US. And at its core, it aims to increase binational research collaboration, cultural understanding, cultural diplomacy, and the exchange of ideas, knowledge, and skills. It was born in the aftermath of the Second World War and the program was established by Senator J. William Fulbright in 1946 with the ethos of turning swords into plowshares. Credits from the sale of surplus weapons were used to fund academic exchanges between host countries and the US. And since its establishment, the Fulbright program has grown to become one of the largest educational exchange programs in the world, operating in 160 different countries. For me, what was so appealing about a Fulbright is that it's a holistic program where the whole person, their cultural identity, the relationships they build, and the cultural exchange they have is just as important as the research that they're doing. 
A key part of the Fulbright application process, if you're thinking of maybe going for one, is to actually craft your own personal statement alongside your research proposal. And if you make it through the first round, you're interviewed, and the focus is just as much on you as a person as it is about the research that you want to do. And this was really evidence to me when they encouraged me to take my family along for the ride. As I mentioned, Gav is here and our 11-year-old twins certainly enhanced my Fulbright journey no end. What is also really distinctive about Fulbright is the enormous, enormous international network it opens up. I landed in New York and I immediately had a community of fellow Fulbrighters from right across the world different cultures, lived experiences, topic areas. And then I came home to Brisbane and found exactly the same. Went out to dinner with a bunch of them on South Bank last week. Once again, those ties and threads right across the world, just what Senator Fulbright imagined. During our Fulbright orientation in Canberra, our very own VC, as I said, Carolyn Errol Evans, who was a former Fulbrighter, was the guest speaker. When describing these connections, she said, Fulbright weaves thousands of invisible threads. I wrote those words down on the hotel notepad and have carried them with me to New York and back again as a reminder. I love weaving, quilting and fabric analogies and the processes that they conjure up as we work through them as creative metaphors. If it weren't for fabric, I wouldn't be here today as it was my dad's job as the manager for a design studio for a fabric company that actually brought us to Australia. The weaves of threads that Carolyn spoke of really illustrates the connections that I made, not only with colleagues and organisations, but also with life, with culture, with my family, and ultimately myself in New York. So, what was my Fulbright actually about and what did I do? I was in New York for three months from April until July this year. I was originally due to go in 2020 to work with my Fulbright host, um, co-editing the fifth edition of Music as a Global Resource for the UN's 75th anniversary. But instead, due to COVID, Barbara and I worked on the compendium virtually with the help of a team from NYU and the CON here. And we launched it online. Not quite the same as previous years where they'd launched it at the UN. It still hurts. The compendium brings together insights from 109 projects in 54 countries, harnessing music to address a range of cultural, social, economic, educational and environmental issues. With the compendium under our belts and the data at our fingertips, Barbara and I had plenty of time to reflect on the really, really unique global view of music that this has revealed. She's on screen right now. Geez, I learned a lot from her. She's not only a leading music therapist and an amazing trailblazer in her field, a faculty member of 48 years at NYU, she has seen and done everything. But also an experienced champion of music across so many diverse contexts, including the UN for decades. My Fulbright also presented an opportunity to enrich my current research, as Vanessa mentioned, which is examining how music can play a role in addressing issues of social injustice and social inequity and bringing about positive social change in communities. In line with what I've just shared about the Fulbright experience, soon after arriving in New York, I changed tack. I'd gone there originally thinking I'm going to gather a lot of data and information about my topic. I quickly realised I needed to change from data collection to connection. So rather than fronting up to musicians and organisations to extract ideas about my topic, I decided to focus more on building relationships, establishing solid foundations that would last much, much longer than a one-time yarn. It gives me the excuse to go back again. This led me to meeting many leading musicians and arts organisations, you can see some of them on screen. Carnegie Hall's Wild Music Institute, I immediately hit it off with. Their social impact team was 
phenomenal to talk to and I had the great experience of uh, going to their lullaby project celebration context which gave me goosebumps as a mum of twins the whole time. I got to meet people from Music on the Inside, a program set up by none other than Wynton Marsalis with um, Alina Bloomgarden, who was the person that actually brought jazz to the Lincoln Centre, and look at the way in which they're working with incarcerated individuals in the jazz context. I loved meeting with uh, colleagues from Arts for Art, which is an organisation that's got social justice aims but works within the free jazz context. So before meeting them, Gav had to give me a quick lecture on free jazz so I could actually discuss a few things with them. Positive Exposure was another amazing NGO that's using photography as a way of changing the way we think about disability. And I loved meeting with colleagues from the Centre for Artistic Activism who are making a real change in the area of voting and rights at the moment through the arts. I attended their concerts, their events and had many conversations with them about how they're using the arts to address a raft of pressing social issues. I also had the great pleasure of exchanging ideas around social justice oriented practice, research, evaluation and impact with colleagues at a range of institutions, many of them you all know, some of you even studied there. I talked a lot with colleagues from NYU but also from the Manhattan School of Music. Steve Newcomb is still very famous there, Boston University, the National Guild of Community Arts Education. I went to DC for the Americans for the Arts National Convention and I also got to enjoy spending time with colleagues from the Global Leadership Program where I'm a faculty member. It's a, an executive program for musicians who are working in social entrepreneurial ways and trying to change the world. And then I spent a bit of time at the UN. I got to share research through keynote presentations, workshops, seminars, I gave a class at NYU which was nice but also importantly aimed to do some volunteering with social purpose organisations that really helped me not only talk the talk but walk the walk and that sharing was just as much um, part of the process as learning from those I met with. So third of all, why did I choose New York? <laughs> of course, a major reason for going there was to spend time with my host, Barbara, at NYU. But in New York, there's a really unique and distinct cluster of renowned musicians, arts organisations and NGOs who've really been driving creative practice in this field of social justice that I wanted to meet. I also New York knew New York was going to provide the perfect sandpit for working through issues of social equity, not only on a professional level but on a personal level. This was my third visit to New York. The first time I went was a couple of months after September 11. The second time I went was a couple of months before Barack Obama was sworn in as president. And this third time was just as charged. New York was coming to the grips of the impact of the pandemic. There was also the outbreak of monkeypox. There was a major surge in gun violence, sparking the perennial debate about gun laws. The Supreme Court reversed Roe versus Wade, setting off huge protests around reproductive rights. Meanwhile, Katanji Brown Jackson made history as the first African-American woman to be sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. Inflation kept surging, which hurt us because we were exchanging everything into Aussie dollars. And the political divisions continued to rage as the January 6 hearings commenced. What a time to be there. For us as a family, coming to understand and connect with New York meant getting out every day, walking the streets, riding the subway and engaging with as much arts, culture and food as we could. Highlights included seeing the 90-year-old John Williams conducting his music at the Met, witnessing close, uh, not at Carnegie Hall, sorry, correction, uh, witnessing closing night of con alumni Brett Dean's opera Hamlet at the Met, experiencing the New York City Ballet's Balanchine Stravinsky program, sports fans, we cheered on the Knicks at the Garden, 
I was a fangirl at a Coldplay concert in MetLife and had to explain to my children why I was acting so strangely when Bruce Springsteen, the boss, came on for a cameo. We also loved dancing to all the summer stages there. Of course, Robert Glasper we saw at Washington Square Park, The Missing Element, the best beatboxes I've ever heard in Bryant Park. And we saw Aussie's own Baker Boy on stage at the Aussie barbecue stage at Central Park. There are so many other amazing experiences we had and the one that always sticks with me is seeing the Jean-Michel Basquiat King Pleasure exhibition, which is a story for another day. And also pulling out my horn and playing um, Taps for Taps Across America on Memorial Day. These experiences lit us up creatively, but it wasn't just the constant excitement of these events that made the deepest impression. It was the day-to-day -day life of living in the city and calling it our home. Family life continued. Our kids were typical tweens. We shopped every day in our little local key foods grocer and I struggled to keep the life work balance in check. If you were to ask me my most memorable experience, I couldn't boil it down to one moment. It was this rich tapestry, those thousands of tiny invisible threads that collectively wove together to provide the greatest experience of my career to date. And in this last frame, before I start telling my stories, I'd just like to say a few words about the um, autoethnographic insights I'm about to share. Autoethnography auto is an autobiographical genre that grew out of shifts in ethnography, and it connects the personal to the cultural, the social, and the political. Today, I have three autoethnographic stories I'd like to share with you, and these have been crafted from journals which I wrote in New York. I followed an autoethnographic process of working these raw journals into a broader context that attempts to weave threads between my personal experiences and the broader social cultural insights they reveal. This process is described by my colleague and collaborator, Carolyn Ellis, when she explains back and forth autoethnographer's gaze, first through an ethnographic wide angle lens, focusing outward on the social and cultural aspects of their personal experiences, and then they zoom inward experiencing a vulnerable self that is moved by and may move through, refract and resist cultural interpretations. What has emerged from this process of zooming in and out, an inherently creative process, are three tales of knowing, being and doing. Having drawn inspiration from First Nations scholar Karen Martin's work on ways of knowing, being and doing for many, many years, it was in this zooming back and looking at what happened and trying to take stock of it all that this framework started to emerge. It's an ongoing process that I'm only really at the start of. I've only been back for six weeks. The stories I'm sharing haven't had the benefit of time for deep processing, meaning making, editing and polishing. There's no slick song and tap dance beautifully packaged up like we've seen in the Con Theatre for 42nd Street over the past couple of weeks. Instead, you have my raw stories still in the making. And the first relates to ways of knowing. As I sit on the steps of the famed Tenement Museum, a strange cocktail of curiosity, compassion and familiarity settles within me. I imagine the footsteps of countless migrant families traipsing up and down these wrought iron stairs and immediately feel an affinity for the complex emotions they must have felt coming and going from their tiny apartments each day. Living a life they could never have imagined before they left not yet fully belonging to this city, yet not belonging to their homelands either. Culturally separated from where they come from, yet culturally nourished by the small yet significant practices they do each day to try and remind themselves of who they really are. The songs they sing, the little games they play, the language shows on the radio, and the food, all that yummy food they cook. Many undocumented, working in exploitive conditions at the mercy of their fears. Inequities and injustices abound as they break their backs to remain above the poverty line. 
So many threads severed on one end, yet threaded into a new weave on the other. A new weave that embraces them for their usefulness, yet doesn't fully see them for who they are. New York's migrant heritage is utterly inescapable. It's so explicitly written at large on the city's tenement buildings, cultural experiences, food offerings, stories, legends, but also in the city's underbelly and its history. This cacophony of cultures seems to overshadow the quiet presence of First Nations voices. They hear, I know they hear, but they're only visible and present to others in unusual places like health ads on the subway and defiant graffiti art acknowledging their presence. Because such a large part of this population is riddled with transience and displacement, questions of belonging are forever present, not just culturally, but socially, economically and politically. With the intersection of these things, belonging always feels like a liminal space that can only be momentarily grasped. I feel the presence of it on those tenement steps, but as I walk a few blocks to the F subway line on the Lower East Side, it's gone, disappeared. Weeks after that tenement visit, one evening this all comes into stark reality for me in the most foreign of places. I've managed to get an invitation to the Fulbright Awards dinner run by an NGO set up to support Fulbrighters in New York called One to World. This is an event designed to bring the who's who of New York to a gala event at the plaza with the purpose of raising lots of money. As I step into my new dress, I'm feeling a sense of trepidation. I do not feel like I belong in places like the plaza. It takes every strength in me to pull myself into that Uber and walk into that ballroom of 400 people not knowing a single soul. One of the speakers is Morgan Radford, a famous NBC News anchor. The clinking of entree plates settles to a quiet hum as she takes the stage. She did her Fulbright in Durban, my hometown. She greets us with the Zulu word I greeted you with today, Sabona. As she says the word, my world stops. I heard this word growing up most days, but I haven't heard it uttered since I left. More than words of politeness, Saborna carries the importance of recognising the worth and dignity in each person. It means, I see you. I see the whole of you, your experiences, your passions, your pain, your strengths and weaknesses, and your future. You are valuable to me. What happened for the rest of the night in that plaza is a story for another time. But as I awake the next morning, I have to get the feelings that are blazing inside of me out. Sabona, Sabona, The Zulu greeting, the welcome from where I am from. It means I see you, but do you see me? Appropriation, I'm sure you're thinking. How does a white girl excuse using that word? The language of the people her people sought to oppress. Well, that's what my critical voice is saying. You have no right to use that word, even though it speaks to your being, even though it brings you goosebumps of recognition, its sound and inflection of familiar hug. It's like the music I grew up with, the music of my bones, the music that sought to fight the system I benefited from, the music that makes me feel me. The theorists, the critics, the finger-wagging monitors, they will tell me this is colonisation and appropriation at work. Go back to where you came from. Leave that Zulu language and music well alone. But their cerebral abstract critique doesn't speak to my life. It doesn't speak to my bones, who I am. Their critique doesn't tell my story, doesn't explain who I am. As my sense of self formed, that was the sound and language that imprinted on me. To deny it feels like recutting the wound that's already there. Home is in that lilt, saborna, kunjoni, wena. The critic comes back. Now you're romanticizing, my dear. This is no longer the voice of my academic finger wagging colleagues. This is the voice of an imagined family member the one who stayed and didn't abandon our country. You're stuck in a sense of nostalgia, a 
romanticised version of our country, stuck in time between when you left and now, not the harsh and daily reality. Just like the music you love, it's not the music of now. It is stuck in a frozen time warp, just like your sense of belonging. You are not only caught between countries, you are caught in time, my dear. Forever caught in between might be my lot in life, but I can't deny how that word shot through my being that night. In this foreign land, this grandiose and unfamiliar ballroom, for the first time in years, I felt seen. As I write this piece, curled up on our apartment couch, tears are streaming down my face. Everything I'm experiencing in New York is stirring up my issues of finding a sense of belonging and be seen for who I am. As a migrant kid growing up in Sydney, my English heritage was a blessing and a curse. A blessing because I blended in, but a curse because nobody saw me for who I was. A girl from Africa. It wasn't like I was allowed to have that identity because I was not African. In many years of working alongside First Nations collaborators, that kind of non-identity has continued as I've personally backed myself out of my own sense of identity and simply positioned myself in a one-dimensional way, non-Indigenous, not belonging. I'm starting to realise how feeling a sense of belonging isn't just a matter of being in a place of familiarity, but being seen for the whole of you. In the plaza, it happened in the bizarrest, most metaphysical way. But I've had similar experiences when I hear township music from South Africa, the music of my bones. I've come to understand that this seeing, I see you, isn't about a singular sensory perception of sight. It's almost like the First Nations concept of dadiri and deep listening, which is hearing with more than your ears. Rather than a singular sense, it's about deep ways of knowing that as Auntie Miriam Rose Ungermeyer Bowman says, it's about tapping into that deep inner spring within us. I'm starting to understand in an embodied sense, such ways of seeing and listening involve seeing inward and recognising that deep inner spring, but also seeing outward to how we see and value others. And for me, arts, culture and language trigger that process. Thinking of my topic, I start to wonder how these complex questions of belonging and being seen, ways of knowing, relate to broader conceptualizations of community and how then do these experiences relate to more macro issues of social justice? How do the arts carve out a space for exploring how these individual experiences might connect to systemic forces and factors that can actually shift injustices like those we've seen in New York's early migrants in the, uh, migrants in the tenements? These questions keep swirling around in my head as we visit the Ford Foundation's Centre for Social Justice a couple of weeks later and we come to see the Everything, Everything Slackens in a Wreck exhibition. It's a modestly small but powerful exhibition of new works that reflect on Asian migration to the Americas in the 19th century. It tells the story of over half a million indentured workers who were taken to plantations as replacement labour following the abolition of slavery. And as the exhibition explains, like enslaved and formerly enslaved people, these migrants have a long and continuing history of living with inequities and injustices. I find the work striking for the space it opens up to consider the way migrants have been seen here in the US, not only individually but on a social level. As I contemplate the works, and you see my photograph of one on screen, and sit quietly watching a video of the artists describing their creative processes, I can see how their art not only allows us to see and hear their truths about these injustices, but tells us who they are and allows us to see the whole of them, their experiences, their passions, their pain, their strengths and weaknesses and their future. As I sit here now 
and look back on all of our experiences in the city. It isn't just in the silent rooms of an art gallery, hidden from street view that we saw this. In New York, we experienced a constant public showing, rehearsing and sharing of cultural identities and a public thinking through how these have shaped and been shaped um, by American culture. A memorable experience was when we joined thousands of New Yorkers in celebrating the inaugural Japan Parade for Japan Day down Central Park West. 80 community groups marched in a colourful display of Japanese culture in America with singing, dancing, taiko, gagaku, kendo, karate and marching bands celebrating 150 years of Japan-US relations and it was really widely covered on the news. Here in the city, thousands of people gathered for Manhattan's first ever Japanese parade. CBS 2's Thalia Perez has more from the festive route on the Upper West Side. It was a celebration of Japanese culture that stepped off on Central Park West from 81st Street to 68th. The celebration was led by none other than George Takei, famous for his role as Sulu on Star Trek. Takei served as Grand Marshal for the parade. America is a great country. Japan is a great country. Look at all these people celebrating a Japan parade in, together in all the diversity of America. It's a glorious day. With music dance and celebration, Japanese culture was brought to New Yorkers by the nonprofit Japan Day Inc. I could see on their faces the same feeling I have when I hear township music or I hear Zulu words like Sabona. I can see the solidarity they have with those in the crowd as they wear Stop Asian Hate t-shirts and carry placards denouncing recent racist violence. The more I experience these public displays of cultural identity through such creative expressions of life, I start to wonder whether being seen and indeed heard can actually bring about more just and equitable relations. Because everything in New York is so compressed and the spatial and the temporal are in such close proximity together, you can't ignore these expressions. But I wonder whether this proximity actually changes anything. Which leads me to my next story, Ways of Being. As I stand in front of the glass on the 104th floor of the Empire State Building, my sense of perception feels askew. I feel like I'm kind of lurching over these iconic buildings, ready to step on them like tiny pieces of Lego. Having spent so much time underground, crisscrossing Manhattan on the subway, this viewpoint takes a while to get used to. I see all the familiar sites that we've visited. So much scale and intensity comes from this proximity. As I try to steal a moment away from the noise of photos being snapped, my mind begins to wonder. When I was at the Tenement Museum shop last month, I picked up this book. It was entitled Tales of Two Cities, Stories of Inequality in a Divided New York. I was struck by the cover, an image so quintessentially New York of a homeless person lying outside an exclusive Fifth Avenue store. I look back at the buildings and start to imagine what's going on in the streets below. And I'm starting to wonder what kind of an impact this proximity has on how people see each other in the city. But this isn't a theoretical question. We are living this every day in the city. As we descend the Empire State and have a quick bite of sushi for lunch, we head back on the subway to our East 97th Street apartment in what used to be known as Spanish Harlem. While technically on the Upper East Side, a short walk away from mind-blowing privilege, we are placed bang at the intersection of the famed Mount Sinai Hospital on one corner, a daytime strip for our homeless neighbours on the other, the Islamic Cultural Centre of New York on the other, and projects, social housing blocks and a church and childcare on the other. As we emerge from our queue line on the 96 subway station, we walk one block along 2nd Avenue. As we walk past McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts and a financial aid shop. Our neighbours' trolleys are parked outside on the sidewalk, laden with plastic bags carrying their life's possessions. 
I can see them through the window of McDonald's and I've come to know their routine and recognise their faces. They're sitting at the table eating fries, which they've carefully laid out on plastic wrapping, making them look like a meal on a plate. Others are rushing in and out of the small bodega with sodas and chips and things in their hands. And by this time in the afternoon, the hawkers have appeared with tables of knockoff items. The rubbish everywhere signals a high traffic space. And by this time in the afternoon, the bins are starting to overflow with fast food waste. And I won't tell you, it smells really bad. The strip is also a well-trodden path for hospital workers coming to and from the sub subway station for their, uh, their shifts. And today I'm happy to see our street corner dancer. <laughs> He's there most days dancing to the most impeccably chosen soundtrack, old and new. Today he's twisting and turning to Stevie Wonder. We then take a sharp left on our East 97th Street and pass a littered vacant block with broken bongs, glass and human waste. My children didn't batter an eyelid. Our apartment is in a small six-storey block. There's no fancy doorman, but it also is in a walk-up. We're lucky enough to have an elevator that opens onto our fourth floor apartment. It's become our refuge and much-loved home. We look out on a long row of beautiful trees and directly behind them are the projects. On Friday afternoons, our street becomes a bustling hive of activity outside the Islamic Centre for the, leak, for the weekly Halakwa. And as I turn off the lounge lamp that night, I see the colourful flashing lights of Mount Sinai Hospital, a beacon of security and comfort on one hand, and a disturbing reminder of everyday illness as well as the pervasive presence of violence we will see on the morning's news tomorrow. The garden bed in our block mostly consists of dirt and rubbish, but it's amazing what a couple of blocks does. Most afternoons we walk down to the 90s and then across to 3rd, Lexington Park, Madison, 5th Avenue and then into Central Park. In a matter of 10 minutes, the immaculately groomed bar garden beds are a sight to behold. We marvel at the classic brownstones and the quintessential old buildings with well-dressed doormen. They say this close proximity brings out a generous sort of spirit in New Yorkers as they share their space with so many others. But this proximity also comes with vulnerability and danger, as we see in the daily shootings, reminders of how close we all are together. This past week, a father, Daniel Enriquez, was randomly shot at close range while he was travelling to brunch on our very own local queue line. I keep asking myself, how does this proximity affect our ways of being in relation to one another? Do we feel compelled to do something about what we see or do we just put up a barrier, become sensitised and sort of shut things off? The proximity principle from social psychology suggests that people do form closer social relationships with individuals who they're closely and physically connected to. I'm still kind of ruminating on these thoughts days after visiting the Empire State. And I'm venturing out to coffee with my colleague from Boston University, Andre de Quatros, at Blue Stain Loan on West 31st. It's an absolutely cold and miserable day. I've stepped in puddles, I have wet socks, and my umbrella can barely hold itself. Andre is a leader in music education, in conducting, in ethnomusicology, and he's a human rights activist having worked in diverse settings such as prisons, peace building and reconciliation with refugees and asylum seekers and with victims of torture and trauma. I start to bumble out these proximity thoughts like I've been saying to you today and the impact they have on systemic levels of injustices and whatnot. And he looks me straight in the eye and he says, proximity does not make a difference. Look at New York. People live in extreme wealth, they walk out the door, their neighbours are in extreme poverty and it makes no difference. For Andre, we need to think beyond proximity to spaces where people engage in dialogue and relationship. In other words, connecting the individual to community and transforming proximity into liminal spaces that promote reflection and connection. 
A few days prior, I experienced what he met during an online session that he hosted for the Race Prison Justice Arts Project he's been running for many years for incarcerated artists. There is a palpable excitement in the room with over 80 people online, many of whom are incarcerated, family members of them and leaders from Boston University Prison Arts Project. And we watch a video of their work. Race Prison Justice Project is solidarity through art making. Race Prison Justice Project is love. It is empathy, and it is empathy through art, a key ingredient to humanize us all. The Race Prison Justice Project is shocking, impactful, and informative. Race Prison Justice Arts is democracy, endurance, love. Even though this space was virtual and I was sitting alone in our East 97th Street apartment, I felt a moving sense of connection with the artists he made space for. We listened to a collect call from one of the incarcerated artists called Truth and he shared a poem entitled Ruminations of a Rogue Prophet. This dialogic space went well beyond proximity. It fostered a relational space to be with others. As I kept stewing on this thought of moving beyond proximity to a dialogic space, I had the opportunity to visit the United Nations the following week. After pursuing a series of connections and how I learnt to network in New York is a story for another day, I'm having lunch with the staffer of 30 years, Predrag Vasic, who conducts the United Nations Staff Recreational Council Orchestra. As we sit in the UN staff canteen overlooking the Hudson River, he tells me of the ensemble of musicians who work at the UN. Through music, they seek to promote peace, friendship and cooperation among nations. And at any given time, they have around 30 different countries and 17 different UN departments represented, as well as diplomatic missions with some extremely high-ranking officials. I am staggered by this thought. Yet in spite of this close proximity with so many staffers playing music, with the building being activated musically each week, as well as all of the artworks on the walls, the arts and music are not part of the core business of the UN and do not penetrate the discussions around social and economic development. When I ask Predrag about this, he explains that it's because there are no formal mechanisms for music and the arts to be included in core business. It might be championed by an enthusiastic minister, but that's as far as it goes. Barbara has so many similar stories from her experiences bringing music to the UN. In thinking about my topic of how music can address social inequities and injustices, it brings home the point that we need to also be keeping our eyes on these more structural systemic levels, as well as the individual and community levels where we so commonly focused. The marginalisation of the arts in the UN just shows the issues we have to grapple with in achieving this. As I leave the UN and look back at this iconic building, its flags flapping in the wind, I keep thinking about these dialogic spaces Andre and I spoke about and the way Truth's work opened up the space to speak to systems of power, spaces to be with others, to play with, rehearse, engage, build community and dialogue about more equitable relations, spaces to restory lives, open up pathways to different futures, to listen to and be heard by others, including decision makers who pull the policy strings. And this leads me to my last story. Ways of doing. As I enter Irving Farm coffee shop down in the village, I'm looking for a face that matches the photo I've seen of NYU professor Steve Duncombe online. 
The large open cafe is buzzing with NYU students, some in intense conversation over iced teas, others sipping coffee while they stare at their laptops. Every time I do this, it feels like a blind date. These meetings with strangers I know well from their work, but have never met before. I can't find anyone who looks like him, so I perch on a stool just to the right of the entrance, and an email pops up on my phone. I am sitting outside Irving uh, on the sidewalk. So I head outside and Steve greets me with this really warm and wide smile. He already has an iced tea, so I quickly grab one for myself. We don't waste any time and jump into discussing our shared interests in social justice work, what he calls artistic activism. He has a long history of practice and research in this space, having co-founded the Centre for Artistic Activism. And he's currently writing a book that outlines a macro theory of change for artistic activism that builds on classic activism theories of change which, trad which traditionally either work on material change, the doing, or the idealist change, which is the thinking. He's adding a middle plane that is activated by the arts, and that's the emotional connection that activates both the ways of knowing and doing, the affect and the effect. When I describe my research to Steve, he raises his eyebrows and smiles a wicked smile. So you're actually talking about change. You realise that's a lot harder to research, don't you? He immediately identifies, I'm not just looking at how music and the arts can lead to outcomes like individual self-determination, community building, social cohesion, like so many others have. I'm looking at how these outcomes might flow up to a systemic level and actually bring about a more equitable world. For him, it's all about the intent and how as artists we know if we've achieved this. He concedes that at the end of the day, there will always be a bit of a black box around what we do. It's not, it's not possible to be explicit about everything, but he believes that as artistic activists we can still sharpen the questions we ask around our intentions and in the doing, how we know if it has worked. There is so much I still want to explore, but our chat is cut short thanks to dark looming clouds above us and a gusty wind that is blowing all the leaves and debris down Thompson Street towards Bleecker Street. We say a hasty farewell, grabbing our umbrellas, and as I briskly walk to the subway and think to myself, that hour with him was worth flying halfway across the world for. New York keeps gifting us these moments. So many tiny threads are being threaded throughout these experiences. And a few days later, Steve's ideas about intention in artistic activism ring in my head as we enter the SVA Theatre on West 23rd for the Tribeca Film Festival. It's unallocated seating, so we make a beeline for the front, hoping Caitlin and Claire might be able to kind of see over the high seats. Tonight, Robert De Niro, is presenting rap artist Common with the Harry Belafonte Voices for Social Justice Award. An Academy Award, Emmy and Grammy Award winning artist, Common has been deeply engaged in social justice and advocacy work around mass incarceration, mental health and voting. And he's being interviewed by New York Times columnist Charles Blow. We watch a film about his work. And then Common and Charles start engaging in this relaxed kind of banter about growing up and his early influences and in music. He tells the story of digging deep when he realised he'd been labelled a conscious rapper and an activist, but he kind of felt like these were just labels. If you're not familiar with the term conscious rap, it's a subgenre of hip hop that tries to challenge dominant systems and critically raise awareness about social issues. Common confesses he hadn't really deeply reflected on his intentions in a way that was fitting of that title. He tells the story of the sacrifices Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier were willing to make, how they were willing to put their lives on the line for what they did to fight for justice and freedom, and how a colleague of his then asked him the question, what are you willing to die for? What are you willing to put it on the line for? Common's answer was complex and simple at the same time. It was my people. Today was represent justice presents common concept.
here at CRC. A lot of this movement is to show the world the narrative of what it looks like for incarceration and to show the world that there are human beings inside of here. All right, we're here at CRC Norco. Um, all the ARC anti-recidivism coalition crew members were here. I believe justice should mean giving you a chance to right your wrong. You had B. Mike was here, a muralist. We are creating a mural and spreading it through them, you know what I mean? Like, their excitement is just being able to be creative, you know what I mean? It was just contagious. This concert made them feel complete and whole, and that's what they're going to talk about. Man, I've served 22 years, man, and I represent justice. I represent justice. I represent justice. I represent justice. As I sat with my family in a tiny ramen place in Chelsea afterwards, this, kept, this question kept ringing in my head and haunting me. You know, what am I willing to die for? What am I willing to put it all on the line for? And by the way, who are my people? At this age and stage in my life, so many family members depend on me. I think of the collective commitment of putting my life on the line for this. Yet I still keep asking myself the question, what am I willing to yield and give up in the service of doing this work for justice and equity? I ask myself, can one's individual sacrifice really flow upstream to make a difference on a systemic level where we know the wicked causes of injustice actually lie? Like Steve said, how can I challenge myself with my intentions, but also know that what I've done has actually made an iota of difference? What is so powerful about Common's story is that he's found a way to draw on that deep well within, to see himself and be seen, and to come to know his intentions. Through hard work and reflection, he's creating that dialogue and dialogic space to be with others so that they might be seen too. He's using rap as a way of not only telling truths of people impacted by an unjust justice system, but he's rewriting stories and lives with a focus on hope. But he also understands that the racial inequities and social justices, injustices he's seeking to address are operating on the systemic level. And through his NGOs, he's working hand in hand with politicians, with policy makers, with decision makers, with community leaders to address these macro issues. His art is what is allowing him to move so effectively between those dimensions from the individual to the community, to the social, and then back again. This resonates so strongly with how I've tried to work in community settings over the past 20 years. But this Fulbright experience and my time in New York is challenging me, uh-uh, you gotta go further. To visit that deep well within and not only see my own cultural identity, but to be honest, also my family stories of trauma and dislocation. And my life's work of supporting family members who continue to suffer the ripple effects of these traumas that manifest in mental illness, substance abuse, precarious housing and poverty. But I also know I need to draw on the resilience, the love, the sacrifice and determination that is part of my family story too. I'm challenged to think about how this deeper knowing can help create better pathways to being with others and working collectively to do the hard work of social justice, the kind of work I'd put my life on the line for. Just as these questions are starting to heat up for me, and I'm making and remaking my story, the New York weather is heating up too. As I look out to the trees in front of the projects, they now have a thick green canopy. They were bare sticks when we first arrived. We've watched the city change from wind, rain and freezing temperatures to blue skies, long summer days and warm nights. As I pack my suitcase, I carefully include the page from the hotel notepad that says, thousands of invisible threads. 
as I've stitched some of these together for you today, I'm mindful how rough and imperfect some of the joins are. It's a work in progress. And I'm mindful of how many of the threads I haven't been able to show you today. There are so many. But I hope that what I've shared has at least given you a small insight into what has been the journey of a lifetime. Thanks for following along with me.